Opera Opera Faust was an instant success when it was first performed in Paris in 1859. One enthusiastic admirer was the composer Berlioz, who wrote a review in the form of an imaginary dialogue. It's charming, isn't it? So touching. The tenderness of an angel, and so full of chaste passion. Oh, yes. A fine word, that. Chaste. Your chaste Margarita is just a little fraud. She gives herself to a perfect stranger as soon as he speaks a few words of love to her, and the next time they meet, this chaste little girl of yours invites him into her bedroom. Oh, do be quiet. You always ruin the romance in everything. Paris, at the time of Gounod's Faust, was a city intrigued by chastity. Its tone was set by the emperor himself, Louis Napoleon. The nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, he had seized power in a coup d'etat of 1851, inaugurating the Second Empire. In public, a dutiful husband and father, he was in private a compulsive womanizer, a man for the times. Paris became the most glamorous city in the world, a dazzling spectacle of carnival flash and fleshly pleasures. Its mayor, Baron Haussmann, redeveloped much of the centre of Paris, pushing the working class out into shanty towns and demolishing the medieval back streets to make way for long, broad boulevards. The result was a restless society of greed and excitement a time to get rich quick, without any scruples. The religion of money is the only one today that has no unbelievers, wrote the poet and critic Théophile Gautier. And at the heart of that religion of money was the ultimate commodity, the desirable woman. Gautier was at dinner at the Café Anglais last night. I heard him utter another one of those famous lines of his. A woman's first duty is to be beautiful. I suppose he meant it as a sort of compliment to the ladies present. But suddenly its deeper meaning made my blood turn cold. That word, beautiful, has been like four walls around my life. I'm trapped inside it. Without beauty, I am hardly allowed to exist. Trapped. Even my clothes cage me in. The steel hoops of the crinoline, the layers of underclothing, the furs, the veils, the gloves. Even my hat shrouds every inch of my flesh whenever I leave the house. She talks, thinks and acts differently. She does not breathe like us. She does not eat like us. Not as much nor the same foods. Why? mostly because she does not digest as we do. Women cannot work for long, either standing or sitting. If she is always sitting, the blood rises, the chest is irritated, the stomach obstructed, the head heavy. If she is kept standing for a long time, she will suffer blood-related accidents. What can I do with my life? There are so few arenas in which an intelligent woman can make a public stand. I have no voice in public. I, I cannot train as a lawyer or a doctor. Yes, I could mould her as a governess. I could set up as a shopkeeper or become a lady of charitable works or a nun. But otherwise, the terrible truth is that an unmarried woman is left with only one opportunity to sell her body, her beauty, as Gautier would put it. If I was the greatest actress, the greatest soprano, or the greatest lady novelist in the world, men would still be thinking, how much does she cost? The idea that any unaccompanied woman might actually be for sale became an obsession. One doesn't know today if it's honest women who are dressed like whores or whores who are dressed like honest women. 
The ranks of officially sanctioned registered prostitutes were swelled as Houseman's new Paris drew thousands of country girls to the capital. Many turned to prostitution full time, others used it to supplement the meagre wages they earned as servants or shop girls. They are everywhere, in the brasseries and the cafes, the theatres and the dance halls. You encounter them in public establishments, railway stations, even train carriages. From the moment I leave this house, my comfortable prison, I am under surveillance. I cannot walk alone to the end of a street without an assumption being made. I keep my eyes to the ground, yet still, every man I pass thinks only of one thing. Well, is she available? And as they wonder how much an hour in my intimate company might cost, they weigh and measure me in their minds. They strip me naked, layer by layer, through the whalebone stays, laces and petticoats, imagining their fingers penetrating beyond the silk and the linen. There were more subtle ways to buy a woman. Men of fashion required an evening at the opera to include a ballet. Having watched the dancers in performance, they would make their way backstage to accost their favorites. The girls' mothers stood at the stage door where acceptable terms could be negotiated. From the stage to the auditorium, from the wings to the stage, and from one side of the auditorium to the other, Invisible threads crisscross between actresses' smiles, dancers' legs, and men's opera glasses in a network of arousal and liaison. One couldn't gather together in less space a greater number of sexual stimuli. At the apex of this trade in female flesh were the courtesans, women who would spend their afternoons parading alone in their carriages waiting for the approach of a duke or a marquis, bearing diamond necklaces, blank checks, and offers of luxurious rented accommodation. The outrageous doings of the courtesans were a constant source of gossip. There was Cora Pearl, the English girl who had once dyed her hair the same canary yellow as the satin which upholstered her carriage. Marguerite Belanger, for two years the emperor's favourite, until his wife Eugenie warned her off. They say that a woman was secretly procured for the emperor himself, and as she waited for him, naked in the anteroom, the Lord Chamberlain told her, you may embrace his majesty on any part of his body, except his face. Another had a lover who gave her a box of marron glacé, each one of which was wrapped in a thousand franc note. I don't know whether half this nonsense is true, but I do know that women of that type have no trouble getting credit from the dealers and shopkeepers. They haven't the slightest difficulty in borrowing money, poor things, and more often than not, end up making themselves bankrupt. No courtesan, no matter how beautiful or mysterious, could keep a fascination for long. A relationship was only a transaction, and a woman who could be bought could also be sold, or simply discarded. The move from riches to rags could take a matter of minutes. A girl like Guno's Margarita had only to transgress the narrow boundaries of feminine respectability in order to fall irretrievably. There's another sort of prison for women too. The prison of the brothel, with its days and weeks of suffocating boredom. Drinking absinthe, smoking cigarettes, playing cards, and waiting, waiting for the night. And the next round of fat, 
fumbling, trembling men. Of course, many women nowadays prefer to practice their trade alone. But then the police hem them in with a hundred regulations. Do not walk the streets before 7pm or after 11. Do not exhibit yourself at a window. Do not loiter near a church or a school. Do not enter a public house. Do not wear a dress of striking colours. Do not touch anybody. Produce your identity card on demand. Ignore any of these absurd commands and they cart you off for two weeks to the prison of Saint-Lazare with women who scream and wail, women so drunk they cannot stand. The nuns are as cruel as any warder. The doctors sneer as they tip you up and examine you for disease. You are left loathing yourself. And this is the abyss that awaits any girl who allows herself one kiss, one glance, one mistake. <laughs> Much of the Second Empire's best art is fixated on the sexuality of women and the implications of that one kiss, one glance, one mistake. It made uncomfortable viewing. Manet's Olympia was described by one critic as portraying the bestial ugliness of a model taken out of the gutter. In his Déjeuner sur l'herbe, the woman's nakedness is shockingly casual and unexplained. In Flaubert's novel, Madame Bovary, and in Zola's Thérèse Raquin, a woman's adulterous passion results in a terrible, self-inflicted death. In Gounod's Faust, it is not the fate of Faust himself, but that of the heroine Margarita that becomes the focus of attention. A woman's temptation, seduction, destruction, always seen from a man's point of view. I went to see the new opera everyone's talking about. A huge success. Exquisite decor. Wonderful singing. Melodies that the barrel organists on the boulevards are churning out all day long. But as I watched this Faust by Monsieur Gounod, I could think only of that poor girl, Margarita. Everything else about the spectacle was pasteboard illusion and glamour. But her fate seemed horribly real to me. Of course, I am in so many ways more fortunate than her. But why are you looking at me like that? What sort of woman do you think I am? <laughs> <laughs> 